Jess and I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. I wanted to welcome you to today's service from wherever you are in the world. I also wanted to give a shout out to my GP Care group that helps me feel connected through the online community here at Grace Point. We're so excited that you've joined us today and we want you to know that here at Grace Point, no matter who you are, who you love, or how you exist in the world, you are welcomed, celebrated, and loved. Enjoy the service. Thank you, Jess from Utah. I love that. Grace Point, we are here. You're here. So glad to see you. Let's stand. Glad you're here today. If you are weary from the Lord, you bear. Keep on.
We're so glad you're here. Again, what we want you to do right now is maybe find somebody that you haven't talked to before. The introverts hate this. I know, I can feel it in the room. But uh, catch up on the week, introduce yourself, meet and greet is what we call this. Go for it. Okay, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I wanna let you know on the front end that I had a cold brew coffee this morning and I didn't have enough to eat and I'm like vibrating with caffeine. So, announcements are at your own risk today, I'm like shaking. 
Anyway, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, announcements. There's a bunch of them today. Um, and if you can scan, if you scan the QR code here, or the one that's here, like you can see this, here, or the one that's on your table, you're gonna get all the announcements. The people that are sitting um, in the chairs back here, there's someone in your row who's awkwardly holding a card, probably. They have it, it's a good excuse to meet somebody, to be like, hey, can I have that card? Also, can we be best friends? That's where the QR code is. Someone on your row's got it, or it's on the table if you're sitting down here or up there. Um, there's a button for weekly announcements, a button for the connection cards. The connection card can be used to sign up for the newsletter, learn how to get plugged in, all that good stuff. Okay, <laughs> my heart's gonna pop out of my chest. Um, <laughs> the Young Adult Meetup, YAM, is our social group for 20 and 30-somethings, meeting at Disc Insider this Thursday at 6.30. Here's the deal about YAM and also Common Ground, which is happening tomorrow evening. It's the post-YAM people, yeah, 30. 40-somethings will be meeting at Hunter Station in East Nashville at 6. Um, the thing about Common Ground and YAM is it's a really good opportunity for, um, like, if you don't know anybody here and, like, coming to church by yourself is a very stressful thing for you, these two things are not, they're very, like, low-key. Like, friendship is, like, the main goal. It's not, we're not going to make you talk about, like, weird stuff. It's not small group. It's not... It's not any of that kind of stuff. It's really just chill. Unless you want to talk, then we'll listen. But, like, that's not the point. You know what I mean? Um, I, when I first started coming here, Yam was, like, my intro into, like, a squad of friends. And now, like, I get to use announcements as my, like, stand-up set, basically. So if you want that kind of community, you should do that for, you should use Common Ground and Yam for that kind of stuff. Um, Josh recently talked about baptism as a ritual of belonging. In baptism, we're celebrating that we belong and that we've always belonged. If you're interested in participating in our upcoming baptism gathering on Saturday, September 18th, please fill out a connection card and indicate your interest in that tell us about yourself section. Someone's gonna get in touch with you, um, get in touch with you with more information. The same day as the baptisms, we have a community social at, Dis at again, at Disc Insider. Diskin is a dog friendly, um, like business, it has a small menu, non-alcoholic beverages, indoor, outdoor seating. It's a casual opportunity, meet new people, get to know them. Again, really low stakes. Um, if you, or no, sorry, we need volunteers for GP Kids on Sunday mornings. This is only once a month, it's not every week, it's just a once a month kind of commitment. If you're good with kids and you're interested, email Tiffany or see Tiffany at tiffany at gracepoint.net. GP Kids is also kicking off midweek gathering soon. If you have a sixth through 12th grader that would like to be a part of those, please reach out to Tiffany for more information. Okay, last one. Each week we take a moment to acknowledge that the work that we do to create a safe, affirming, and transformative community is made possible by your generous financial support. To those who already support us, thanks. If you would like to become a part of, a, of financially sustaining the work of our community, here's how you can do it. You can text Grace Point 77977 Go to gracepoint.net slash give, scan the QR code on the screen or on the card, and we also have a Venmo, which is at gracepointtn. Thank you for sticking with me. I didn't have a heart attack. Very proud of myself. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Did we say hey to the online community? Did we do that? Let's do that. Online. Glad you're with us. Oh, uh -huh.
of Grace Point. We're so glad you're here, whether you're in the room or wherever you're joining us from online. We're thrilled you're with us today. Can we thank our band? Yeah. Um, so we're in this series called What About 2.0, and what we're doing in this series is just responding to the what abouts of faith shift, faith change. That for so many of us, as our faith has unraveled, deconstructed, whatever language is comfortable for you, it raises all kinds of questions about what we do with certain things. Um, and I want to give you a little a peek at where we're going over the next several weeks, uh, just so you'll know. But uh, today we're going to talk about what about tithing. And I think you would probably rather talk about what about demons and what about Satan <laughs> and what about going to the dentist for a filling without Novocaine. But uh, I promise it's not going to be bad. Next week we're going to sort of button this, this version of the series up with a question response time. So next week, the sermon time will be just questions. So you can ask questions, folks online. We'll sort of do what we did last time, which is a question from the room, a question from online. And we'll just spend six or seven hours together just seeing what you're interested in and <laughs> what we haven't covered. And then the next week on the 28th, we're beginning a new series. Uh, and it's centered around a book a friend of ours wrote, a guy named Brian McLaren. Any Brian McLaren fans in the room? Uh, Brian wrote a book called Naked Spirituality several years ago, and it's uh, a life with God in 12 simple words. And so we're going to focus on a different word each week of the series, words like thank, or thanks, or no, or yes, and we're going to explore that. Uh, but the very first week of the series on the 28th, Brian McLaren is actually going to open the series for us uh, online. So he's going he's to send a sermon in. He won't be here in the room, but Brian is going to be the one to kick off the series and talk, sort of give an introduction to where we're going over the next then over the next 12 weeks, which will get us up to Advent, which is Christmas time. Can you believe it? How many of you already have your tree up? Let's just be honest. And it's probably because you never took it down. Because once you get to July, it's like, well, we're almost there. Why bother? Just leave it alone. Uh, so that's what's coming. 28th, a new series. Brian McLaren will be kicking that off. Uh, but today, we're going to talk about what about tithing. Uh, and I, I listen, Nobody's gonna, nobody feels more awkward right now in this room than I do. Because money and church are awkward and uncomfortable when they get brought together, right? Like, we, we understand, I think, at some unspoken level that, that doing this sort of thing requires some, some funds to do it. But yet, it's really, really awkward. It's awkward to talk about. It's awkward to engage in. It's awkward for those of us who are, like, leading the thing. It's awkward for everybody, I think. And part of that's because of all the ways money has been abused and uh, all, all of the guilt and shame that has been wrapped around it, right? Anybody ever watched a televangelist give a sermon and they pick a random Bible verse like Psalm 37, 12, and they're like, God wants you to give $37.12. And if you send that in right now, God's going to bless you by quadrupling it. And it's coming back. Like, how many of you have been a part of that sort of thing? Um, or somebody's been talking about money and like they, they use that whole guilt Shame, shame shtick, like you need to do this because God wants you to. And if you don't, if you don't give to the church, then God's not going to bless you. And actually, if you don't give to the church and support what we're doing, then you're probably going to get a flat tire on the way home. And it's not just a random act. It is God. It is God giving you flat Because they have nothing better to do than give people flat tires who don't donate to the church, right? Um, and, and then there's the problem of churches who seem to care more about building a brand or dabbling in real estate. Um, than they do about caring for, for the vulnerable, right? I mean, this, uh, this idea that at one point this movement was about caring for the vulnerable, and now it seems to be about, like, who has the coolest fog machine and light show and the biggest buildings and the coolest coffee shop, and it's, it's a little uncomfortable. So here's what I want to do. Let's all, let's all just, not too close. I know the CDC reversed some guidelines, but we don't want to breathe on each other. But let's all take a deep breath because none of that's going to happen today. We're not going to pass the bowls a second time. You know what I mean? Anybody ever been in a service like that? Like, you know what? We didn't get enough the first time, so we're going to send it around again. Um, and you're like, well, it's like you're being held up, right? It's like they're holding you up. You can't leave until you do this. That's not going to happen today. No guilt, no shame. Here's what I'd like to do. I want to do sort of an overview of what tithing meant in the Bible. Specifically, I want to talk about what was tithing in the Hebrew Bible, what some people call the Old Testament. Was tithing taught? Or commanded in the New Testament. And then I want to bridge from both of those to how do we think about this at Grace Point? Specifically, how do I think about it? Because I'm the one up here talking. I'm sure if you were to poll everybody, everybody on our leadership, there'd be different perspectives. That's cool. I'm going to tell you how I approach it as your lead pastor. Does that work? 
So it's totally, so a little bit of history, and then we'll tie it up at the end with what we do. So let's begin with this. In, in the Hebrew Bible, tithing in the Hebrew Bible, the word tithe in the Hebrew Bible, and we're going to come to this is why I'm telling you this, it's the word ma'aseir in Hebrew, uh, ma'aseir, and it means one-tenth. Okay, so just keep that in mind. A tithe is one-tenth. It's 10%. Uh, that's what the word means. So if we turn to the Torah, which is the, the law, the first five books of the, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, it's called the Torah, and it means law. And within the Torah are the commands that sort of, there's 613 of them that, that guide the life of a Jewish person, um, speci specifically in the era that Jesus would have lived in. Now, the way tithing worked in the Hebrew scriptures was it, like it seems pretty simple, right? Tithing is a tenth. So you, you get all this money over here that you made and you go one tenth and you give it to the church and then you're done, right? That is not at all how it worked. It was a very complicated system in the Hebrew Bible. And it functioned on a seven-year cycle. And what that means is, every, for, so for seven years, you would be doing different things depending on the year. And the seventh year was a year off because the seventh year, because these, these folks weren't dealing with money, right? In the time the Hebrew Bible was written, they weren't dealing with money. They were dealing with crops, and they were dealing with oil, and they were dealing with wine. And they were, that, that was what they were tithing off of. And the seventh year, the command was, every seven years, you, you have to give the land a Sabbath rest. You let the land breathe. Because in the Bible, all those years ago, they understood that you can't just keep demanding from the earth, the earth will wear out. And so at some point, you have to give the earth a break. And so in that seventh year, you would have saved some that you would live off of, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't be growing anything, and so you wouldn't be tithing. So the seventh year was an off year. Uh, and depending on what year it was, you did different things. So the first thing you did every year was something called the terumah. And the terumah was uh, when you bring in your harvest before you do anything. You can't do anything with it until you make this offering. And the word terumah literally means offering. And it means you separate from your grain, oil, and wine the, the first, well, and it wasn't 10%. It was generally somewhere between 140th to 160th. The goal was 150th. You would give the, the, to the priests you would give them an offering of 1 50th of what you had. Now, some people would be really generous and do 1 40th. Some people would be a little stingy and do 1 60th, but it's somewhere in that window. And you would give this to the priests, and the priests have to eat it in a state of ritual purity. So you make this offering, the priests get it, they have to be ritually pure, and then they consume the food. And you can't do anything with your crops before you do this. Um, and once you do this, it's th then you're sort of in a little more wiggle room, but this has to happen first. After you give to the priest, there would be, be the first tithe, which in Hebrew is ma'aseir rishon. Uh, it means the first tithe. Uh, and it was one-tenth of the remaining crop. So you've already given the priest somewhere around one-fiftieth. And now of what you have left, you give one-tenth of the crop to a group called the Levites. Um, they created a blue jean company. Um, and that's, that's how they made their fortune. But before they were doing denim, they were a group of people who did lots of things around the temple. They had temple responsibilities. They were sort of the music leaders. They, they would do different things around the temple. And the reason you would give an offering to them is when the, the land was parceled out, there were tribes, right? Well, the Levites were a group of people who got no land. They received no inheritance. So they were dependent on receiving tithes from the people. And so you would give one-tenth to the Levites, but then the Levites had to turn around and give one-tenth to the priests who were living pretty good, right? They got it from you, and then they're getting it from you again because they're getting it from the Levites. So that's the first tithe, and it's, it's really not 10% of everything because you've already given a chunk of that away. It's 10% of what's left, and then the second tithe, the Maaseir Shani, uh, is another tenth that you would take to Jerusalem with you while you go to like a festival, and you would eat it with your family in a state of ritual purity. So this tithe isn't really you giving it away, but you have to earmark it for travel. Because we're going to go to the temple. And if you couldn't travel with it, you could do a thing where you gave some coins instead. But generally, you take this with you as an act of worship, and you eat together with your family in the presence of the divine. And that only happened on years one, two, four, and five. Told you it's complicated. So you have to wake up and go, what year is it? Is it one, two, four, or five? Because on years three and six, you would do something different called the Ma'aseir Ani, which was every third and sixth year of the seven-year cycle, you would make an offering to the poor. You would essentially give whatever that tithe was to the poor. 
So built in the tithe system, there's, we have these people who serve us in this way, the priests and the Levites, and we have to make sure that they are being taken care of, and so we give a tithe to them. But then there are these other folks over here who are part of our community who, who don't have enough to eat, and they're not making it. So we're going to make sure we earmark and give to them. Every third and sixth year, we're going to give them 10% of the remaining crops so that they can have enough food to eat. The Hebrew Bible actually really cares a lot about how the vulnerable are treated. It, ca it cares a lot. There are commands in there about when you're harvesting your grain, your fields, don't harvest to the edges. Leave some for those who don't have any grain to harvest. And listen to Deuteronomy 14. This is uh, a text dealing with all these tithes. Every third year, you must bring the tenth part of your produce from that year and leave it at your city gates. Then the Levites, who have no designated inheritance like you do, along with the immigrants, the orphans and widows who live in your cities will come and feast until they are full. Do this so that the Lord your God might bless you in everything you do. Right? Le leave some so that those who are hungry can come and feast until they are full. And that was tithing in the Hebrew Bible. Now question, is that 10%? It's a lot more than 10%, right? It, it's 10% and then 10% and then 10% on top of 1 50th percent. Right? Like, so it, 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 it's complicated. But this was a regular rhythm on a seven-year cycle that would have been engaged in. So that's, that's how the Hebrew Bible approaches it. There's nothing like that commanded in the New Testament. Now, I think you can make an argument that until the year 70, when the temple was destroyed, that even the followers of Jesus, because they never converted to Christianity, because Christianity didn't exist, they would have still probably practiced this in some way. Um, so it was probably happening but it wasn't something they were talking about uh, in the letters of the New Testament. Here's what we get in the New Testament about tithing. Absolutely nothing. Zero. Doesn't show up in the New Testament. Here's what shows up in the New Testament. These early Jesus communities were what we would call share communities, which means that they were groups of people coming together and sharing their resources. If you go to Acts chapter 2, you'll find that one of the, one of the responses people had is that they brought their stuff together and made sure everybody had enough food to eat. In Acts chapter 4, it talks about people selling their property and selling different things and giving the money to the community to care for the poor and to make sure everybody had enough food to eat. These communities were radically egalitarian. Everybody had enough. They were all pooling their resources to make sure everyone was sustained. So technically, tithing's not taught in the New Testament, but selling all your stuff and giving the money away is definitely taught in the New Testament. But nobody's telling us to do that, right? Uh, so they're share communities. Uh, and I, I think these communities, we should understand them as communities of resistance. Because they weren't just doing this because this would be neat. They were doing this because the empire was literally killing people. People were starving to death. They were unable to care for themselves. And this community is saying, we're going to resist the brutality of empire, not by picking up swords and, and hacking away. We're going to resist the brutality of empire by refusing to play their economic game. We are not going to do the economy of the, uh, the survival of the, survival of the fittest, that's a thing, economy. We're, we're not going to do this thing where we just let some people fall to the wayside and starve to death. Whoever comes in, whoever's a part of this community, they will eat till they are full, are full every time. They will have a roof over their head. They will be cared for. It's a resistance to the way things are, to the brutality. Of the, and it's, it's enacting Jesus' kingdom vision. I, I think what got Jesus way more in trouble than his whole, like this idea that God loves everybody. That, like, they didn't crucify Jesus because God loves everybody. They crucified Jesus for saying God cares about the poor. God, God cares about the injustice that's being wrought by the empire, and God wants us to do something about it. And here's how we're going to do it. Everybody get around the table. Here's some bread. Here's some wine. Let's change how the world works. And then second, there, there is this command in the couple of Paul's letters about a collection that was being taken for the poor in a, the Jerusalem community. So the Jerusalem community was, one of the, was probably the earliest community that actually was formed around the teaching of Jesus. And when Paul goes out into the world, he start to bring, he's starting to bring Gentiles in and and. They're generally, many of them are wealthy, and these communities are growing, and so the community in Jerusalem was struggling, and so Paul decides one of the, maybe one of the best ways to show them that we're not their enemy or doing something different than they're doing is to say, gosh, what if we take up an offering and send it to them? 
so that they can have enough food to eat. So it's not just our community being cared for, it's all the community. Let's send an offering. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul writes to them, he's like, I want to talk to you about this offering. Here's what you should do. On the first day of every week, everybody should bring whatever money they've decided they can give in keeping with your income. Right? So Paul's not, he's saying, like, let's not put you in danger here, but bring what you can share and collect it every week. And then when I come through town, I'll get it, and I'll take it to Jerusalem with some, you, you can choose some people to come with me, and we'll go and we'll give it to the community there. Now when we get to 2 Corinthians, we get to 2 Corinthians, which is, scholars say probably not just one letter, but a couple different letters of Paul that sort of got mashed up together because they were only in fragments. We get to 2 Corinthians, guess what they haven't been doing? They haven't been setting aside some money and keeping with their income to give to the saints in Jerusalem who are hungry. And so Paul starts, I mean, he's got some brilliant lines in there, right? It's sort of passive aggressive. It, it's like, well, you know, I mean, Jesus was rich, but for your sake became poor. It's a shame you can't do that for the church in Jerusalem. <laughs> brilliant, Paul. The other point is like, look, we're not, trying to, we're not trying to put you in a bind, and we don't want you to give, but you know, God loves a cheerful giver. It's in there. It's in there. Like, and look, here's the thing. Paul's not trying to build a new addition to the church building. So we can give him a little slack. He's trying to feed hungry people. He's trying to care for those who are struggling. So we can, like, he's using a little guilt, but it's like, this guilt's okay guilt, right? Because he's not, he's not saying, like, I, I need a private jet. All this walking back and forth from Jerusalem to all the places is exhausting. So can I, can I get a private jet? He's saying, look, we, we need to be caring. You guys... And then he uses this other, the, he calls it the Macedonian church. You know what the Macedonian church is doing? Way more than you all. <laughs> like literally, is sort of his argument. He's like, I, I want you to be jealous of what they're doing because they are killing it. And by the way, Corinth, you're quite wealthy. The Macedonians are quite poor themselves. And they are taking what little they have and they're sharing it with their siblings in Jerusalem. So I don't know, maybe cough up a little. So that's, that's the New Testament perspective. It doesn't really tell us what they were doing on a regular basis. It doesn't tell us how they were doing it. It, it's just, uh, it just says, like, they definitely were living in community where they were sharing their stuff and they were caring for one another generously. They were definitely taking up offerings to care for poor communities. They, they were doing those things. So here's the thing. Tithing is not taught in the New Testament, but generosity and intentionality are. Right? So Paul's thing is like, look, Whatever you can do in keeping with your income. And on the first day of the week, let's do it then. So that you're building toward it all week long. So you do that, you bring it, you give it, right? Like there's this intentionality to it. And caring for the poor and sharing resources is definitely taught in the New Testament. And it's not even commanded as much as it's assumed. That to be a part of a countercultural, subversive community that centers around the teaching of Jesus, that we're going to be handling our stuff differently. And we're going to be thinking more, le less just about what we are doing and more about what we are doing, if that makes sense. And, and so with those two sort of backdrops in mind, how do we think about this at Grace Point? You know, one of the things that happens um, when a community goes from a more conservative church community to a progressive church community is you lose, you lose some things along the way. Like you lose the fear motivator. Right. How many of you have ever been in church and you just were afraid not to give money? Right? Yeah, it's a real thing because it's being t you're being told God wants this. If you don't do what God wants, then you're going to be in big, big, big trouble. You lose shame as a motivator, thankfully. I'm not, I'm not lamenting this. I'm celebrating it. I, I hope that when you come to Grace Point, you never leave here feeling worse about yourself. I hope you never leave here feeling like there's something broken about you. I hope you never leave here feeling like you just don't measure up. Fear and shame and guilt are things that we have been, had uh, sort of put on our backs that we were never intended to carry. And so in whatever we're talking about in this community, it will never be talked about through the lens of fear, guilt, or shame. That's it. And there's also a tension that as a community, for us to do what we do, we need money, right? Like, we, we don't own real estate, we rent a space, but that costs money. Having staff costs money, doing things we do in the world costs resources. But I wanna promise you this, 
whether you give and whatever you give here at Grace Point will never get you or limit your access to what's happening at Grace Point. And here's what I mean. If you give a bajillion dollars, please, if you give a bajillion dollars, is that even a number? I don't think that's a number, but let's pretend you gave so much that they invented a new number for it. Bajillion, we'll call it that. If you get a bajillion dollars and somebody else is unable to give anything, you are equals in this community. There is no VIP section. Right? That, that's just how it works here. Nobody buys access to anything that anybody else can't just have access to. That's not how we function as a community. There's this great line in the book of James where he talks about showing favoritism in a community like this. And he says that when people come into the gathering, that there are people who are sitting down. And you, other people come in, wealthier people. And the people sitting down are told to get up and give them their seat. And they can go sit on the floor. And James is not happy about this. Because that is anti-Christ. That is anti-Jesus. That is against the ethic of the Jesus community where we are all equals regardless of who we are, regardless of gender identity, regar regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of anything. We are one in this community. Amen. So you will never get more access or lose access based on how many dollars you put in the online offering or in person, whatever. You will never lose or get access because of that. It will never use shame and guilt to motivate you. We're gonna do two things, real simple. We're going to invite you to participate in supporting this community in two ways. One, we're going to invite you to do it because what Grace Point does is helpful and meaningful to you. Now, if what we do is not helpful or meaningful to you, good news, you are off the hook. <laughs> and by the way, if you just changed your mind that what we do is no longer helpful or meaningful to you, we're going to grandparent you in on this and pretend like it's meaningful to you. But, but here's what I mean. If... if why in the world would you give money to something that doesn't help you? Why would you give money to something that doesn't enrich your life? I remember I got to hear the great scholar Marcus Borg preach the, Jan like the march before he passed in January. He's one of my heroes. I got to hear him preach once. And I remember him saying in that one of those lectures he gave, he's like, if you're going to church and you're miserable, go somewhere else. Life is too short to spend one day a week at the minimum, miserable. If you walk away from church every week going, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. <laughs> go do something else with your life. Like, there's no need. It's, so, so, like, if that's where you are, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't at all. But if what, you, if what you find here is meaningful to you, if being a part of this community has helped you feel seen, if it's helped you feel not alone, if it's helped you take steps on your journey of transformation, if it's, it's given you a place to call home when you felt sort of unmoored and un, untethered, and if it's helped you come back to the Bible in a way that is at least less yucky, if, if it's helped you reconcile uh, your changing I ideas, your changing theologies, your changing convictions, with, with, if it's helped you unite that and realize that it's okay to have questions and still be a follower of Jesus. Or if you want to use the word Christian, I'm increasingly finding problems with that word, but if that's, we're not going to concede it yet. Um, but if that's, if that's happening for you, then of course we would love your support um, because there are other people who've supported us for years and that's why we're able to do that and that's why you were able to connect. Does that make sense? It's sort of like this, this idea of like going to a party and never taking anything, <laughs> but like going in and just enjoying what everybody else brought, right? It's like, no, no, if you want this, if you want the party to continue, then bring some like little, little ham and cheese or something. Like bring something to the... Now literally, do not bring ham and cheese in here next week and put it in the offering. Okay? No, please don't. Um, it is a metaphor. We are not literalists in this community. It's a metaphor. But, but if what we do is meaningful to you, then consider how you might help. Now that may look different for lots and lots of people. Look, if you're struggling... If you're struggling to put food on the table, if you're struggling to pay your bills, we do not want you to give one single penny to this community. Not a single penny. And we don't want you to feel bad about it. There's this story that keeps popping up for me in the Gospels where Jesus is standing with his disciples and he's just given them this warning. Be, be really, really cautious of people who, cer certain religious types who will devour widows' houses. And what he meant is, watch out for these people who will take everything they have in the name of God. 
And he's standing at the temple treasury, and he watches this poor widow put in her last two pennies. And he says to his disciples, look, look at all of those people putting in vast amounts, and they're giving out of their wealth and their abundance, and, but they don't even feel it. And this poor widow is giving her last two pennies. And we have read that and read that over generations to mean Jesus is praising the widow, right? Be like the widow. Give your last two pennies to the Lord. And actually what Jesus is doing is condemning a system that would take her last two pennies when the system is actually supposed to be taking care of her. Right? If you're struggling, please don't give us anything. Your presence, your participation is more than enough. And we don't want you to feel bad about it or guilty about it. Right? And for the rest of us, we, we, don't, like, we don't want you to be like, well, we're going to need to see your income tax statement because we need to know that you gave us 10%. Uh, we would never stop you at 10%. <laughs> ever. 20, 30, 40, whatever. 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 It's all about grace. Um, look, and, and here's the other thing. It, it's probably a good idea. Like, like church shouldn't be the only place you're contributing. There are other places you want to contribute. Of course, we recognize that. We just want you to partner with us as consistently as you, and generously as you possibly can to make this thing happen so that it can still happen for you, so that we can still do what we do to help you take the next step on your journey. And, and take church off the table. Being generous and intentionally generous is a really good discipline and practice to have in your life. Right? It's this idea that everything I get is not for my consumption, but there are other things and people around me who need some of what I have. And if I have an abundance, it is a responsibility of mine to share with other organizations and people who are doing the work and doing really beautiful things in the world that I want to be a part of. Because when you contribute to an organization, regardless of how active you can be in the organization, whatever they're doing in the world is partly because of your contribution, right? Um, so it's a great time to defund the evangelical church. Um, because <laughs> what they're doing in the world isn't making the world better. Um, but, that's a hashtag right there. Um, but, when you contribute, which, which is why it's a real thing, right? Like, there are people all over the place contributing to churches that are causing lots and lots of harm in the world. And if Grace Point becomes that church, please stop giving us your money. If we become a community that's harm, more harmful than we are helpful, then please stop giving us your money. But until that time comes, we would love to have your support and your participation in this way so we can keep doing what we're doing for you. And number two, uh, because we want to share this work of Grace Point with others who really need it. Right? There, there are people who really need what we offer, the kind of safety and community we offer. And if, if COVID taught us anything, it's that they're not just in the Nashville area. Right? We have an entire online community joining us right now. And they have been with us throughout this entire pandemic, and there are new people popping up. And I know I've already seen, welcome to you new folks who are there for the first time, here for the first time this week. Every single week, we hear from people who have found us for the first time. And it's this mixture of disbelief and unbelievable excitement and gratitude. But the reality is there are lots and lots of people who need what we're doing in the world. I'm going to shock you that Many, most churches are not progressive. And I know, I want you to sit with that for just a minute. Um, I want you to sit with that for just a minute. It's shocking to hear. And that most communities, or at least many, many, many communities, don't have anything within driving distance. The, the people I'm talking to are not like, oh, we're going to join Grace Point Online because there are just like 10 or 15 other progressive churches, but we like the flamingos on your shirt, so we're with you. That's just not how it works. There just aren't a lot of progressive churches. And, and there are not a lot of places where people can go and bring the fullness of their humanity. And I hope you know that that's what you are invited and welcome to do here. You're, you're invited to bring the fullness of your humanity the messiness of it, the, all the doubts and questions and all the confusions and all the, you, you know what, H how many of you are a little bit cynical about religion in here? So all of us. Um, that's, you're welcome to bring that here. You're welcome to bring that here. And, and for us to, to be able to offer this, 
we need the support of all of us who can. Because there are, I mean, I, I hear every single week, I'll get either uh, direct messages or emails from people. And I'm, I'm not talking like people just in the U.S. I'm talking, we have a growing community in Australia of people who are all over the place who found us. And they never really get to watch us live because they're asleep. But it's meaningful to them. And they feel connected to all of us on Monday morning or whenever, when they, when they log on and experience this gathering, they feel connected to all of us in really beautiful and profound ways. I hear from people who are genuinely stunned when they watch a gathering and there's a little bit of, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Where's the asterisk? You're fully welcome here, but. And of course they are. And of course many of you have been. Because you have been in toxic religious systems, you've been hurt, you've, you've been taken advantage of, you have, and that system was trying to get as much out of you as they possibly could before they told you you only could go so far within the system. And that's not what we're about here at Grace Point. And if we ever become about that, I hope you will all leave, or at least call us out on it. Because... The world doesn't need more churches that are spewing out toxicity and are taking advantage of people. The world needs more churches where hurt people can go and be told that you're, it's, you're, not, you're not crazy, you're not alone. The, the questions and the doubts and, and wanting to live into your full humanity, that's not sinful. That's actually a necessary part of the journey of you reaching the point of human flourishing. And that is our North Star in this community. And when we invite you every week to scan that QR code and contribute whatever you can, without saying it, what we're saying is this thing matters to so many people. And there are people every single week who are finding it. Uh, every, every time I've, somebody messages me on like TikTok and says, I just found your church. And we're going to come in person or we're going to log in online. And how do I become a part of a care group? And how do I, how do I, how do I? And I just sense this, this excitement because, oh, no, this is, we can actually engage here. And every week when we put that QR code up, what we're saying is let's keep this going. Let's keep this going. I don't need a jet. <laughs> if I ever ask you to buy me a jet, I am under duress. Call someone. <laughs> And, and we, will, we will never use the guilt shit. We'll simply invite you to participate like we do every week. Does this matter to you? Has it helped you take a step? Has it brought some healing? Has it given you some hope? Has it made a difference in your life? Would you like to see that happen for other people? Would you like to see their lives be transformed? Would you like to see them sort of be able to become excited about a community again? Would you like to see them find the same hope and the same healing that you're currently experiencing? If so, we'd love for you to participate. Every time I talk about this community with people, I, I really do feel a little bit like I can't believe I get to do this with my life um, b because you're incredible. And what has happened over the last couple of years through COVID is this community has grown and blossomed and we have a whole new group of community members that we would never have met if we didn't go online. And it will take all of us doing whatever we can. And it's not just about the money piece, right? There's all sorts of things that happen in a community that we'd love your participation in. But, but this is the invitation. Not the command. Not the demand. Not the guilt trip. Not, not sprinkled with shame. Simply an invitation. Does this community matter to you? Then in whatever way you can, will you join us? And for those of you who have and are and do, we are so grateful. Literally, wouldn't be in this room, wouldn't be online without your support and your engagement. And we are so, so grateful. And for those of you who aren't yet, we'd love to have you join us in whatever way you can. Are you with me? Yeah. yeah. Wasn't so scary, was it? I mean, <laughs> wasn't so scary. Now, here's the thing. What, I think the understanding of what we're trying to do is we're trying to always be prepared to build a bigger and bigger table because there are more people who need seats, right? 
there are people who are longing to have a, not, not, not just sort of standing in the back watching everybody else at the table, but there are people who want to be at the table. And so when I think about what we're doing as a community, it's like we're always adding extra chairs. Yeah. We're always adding extra, extra spaces so that more and more people can come and join us because there are more and more people who are discovering that you can actually still have a meaningful relationship with your faith and it not be toxic and terrible and harmful. And so let's just keep doing that, shall we? Yeah. All right, let's pray. God, I'm grateful for this community, so grateful for this community. Grateful for the ways over the past couple of years we have transformed and grown and changed and added new seats again and again and again and again. And may we always be about that work and that vision, just creating more spaces. May we be about that work at, at seeing one another welcoming our full humanity every single thing that makes us the beautiful humans we are and even the messy parts especially the messy parts so may we keep this work going may we keep moving forward and may our lives and the lives of people we haven't even met yet be transformed because of it we offer this in gratitude and everybody said
I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm going to give you um, a nice thought from Nadia Bowles Weber. And then after, I'm going to, I think I'm going to scrap saying grace and peace be with you. It's not because I don't like that. It's just sometimes grace and peace are really hard to find. And I don't always think that that phrase is helpful. So I'm going to change it to something that's a little more helpful. Um, your thoughts from Nadia Bowles Weber come from her blog. And she says, and as the love of God moves from your heart, from, no, sorry, let me start over. And as the love of God moves from God's heart through your own to those in your care, may your heart soak up all that it needs in that process because your heart is a human one too and it deserves to be well attended to. We love you and we're proud of you. Have a good one. Thank you all. Have a good week. We'll see you next time.